You know, Mark, one of the things I really appreciate about you is the way you blend apologetics and evangelism so effectively. Well, thanks. But here's a question I've never asked you. What do you say when someone says to you, well, you know, you can't argue people into the kingdom of God? Oh, yeah, I hear that a lot. And you know, what I say is, I partially agree with that. In other words, you need more than just information and evidence. I mean, you need conversations. You need to hear the gospel. You know, you got to really consider the cross. The Holy Spirit has to be working. It all has to come together. But evidence and apologetics is a really critical part to kind of break that down the barriers mm -hmm. in that journey toward Christ. I love that imagery because that's exactly what happened to me. The evidence, one by one, knocked down the barriers until I came face to face with Jesus and then I had to make a decision about it. And that's a great picture of what we want to do. We want to help people make their case for Christ so they can reach their friends with the gospel. Hi, I'm Lee Strobel. I'm here with Mark Middleberg. He and I have been ministry colleagues for, what, over 30 years now? Long time. And today we're at the beautiful Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. You know, I wrote a book called The Case for Christ, and it tells the story of my journey from atheism to Christianity. It was made into a major motion picture that's shown all over the world. But the purpose of this course is to help you make your case for Christ. You've already looked at 1 Peter 3.15, which is that imperative that tells us that all Christians need to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks them to give the reason for the hope that they have and do it gently and respectfully. Well, that verse, Mark, is not only the theme for this course, but in a lot of ways, it's a theme for my life, your life, and our ministry together. That's right. And as we've taught that verse over the years, I've noticed that a lot of times as Christians, we want to do one part or the other. Uh, either we want to give answers, and there's some people that, man, they give answers, <laughs> but they don't want to do the gentleness and respect part. And uh, sometimes that can really shut people down. Uh, or some people do the opposite. They want to be gentle and respectful and just kind of let everyone believe what they believe, but they don't want to give an answer. Yeah. And then they're not really an influence for Christ. They're not making their case for Christ. You know, John Stott once said to me, he said, you know, truth without love is too hard and love without truth is too soft. Yeah. And I There's think Jesus had that perfect balance and that's what that verse is calling for us to have, a balance. In, in not just presenting evidence, but doing it in a way that reflects our love and our empathy and concern for the other person. That's exactly right. And when we do both halves, that is powerful. When we give an answer, but we're winsome and uh, you know really respect the other person and listen to them and care about them. And, and they know that it's, it's for them, that we love them, that we care about who they are and uh, what they believe yeah. and, and want them to know and discover what we found in Christ. And that really is a description of what we've tried to do in our lives. And really that verse, as you said earlier, it really represents our own stories. Yeah, it does. You know, I, my story is that I was an atheist for much of my life. And it was my wife's conversion to Christianity that prompted me to take my journalism training. Uh, I was a legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. And to take my uh, journalism experience and to systematically investigate is there any credibility to Christianity or any other world religion? And after spending a lot of time intensively investigating these issues, uh, the science of it, the his history of it, I became convinced that the evidence points powerfully and persuasively toward the truth of Christianity. And it caused me to want to put my trust in Christ and then my life, my values, my character, my worldview, my philosophy, my attitudes, my relationships. I mean, all aspects of my life over time began to change for the good. You know, my story, and we've often talked about this, Lee, is, is very different from yours because you were raised, you know, not really believing in God. You were an atheist. Um, I grew up in the church. I knew what was right. I knew the Bible verses. I went to camp and memorized, <laughs> you know, I, I threw my log in the fire and gave my testimony. I knew what I was supposed to believe, 
The problem was I didn't know why I believed it. I didn't know the evidence, the kinds of things we're talking about in this course. And that's a description of a lot of Christians. It sure is. They believe, they just don't quite know why they believe. Right. So what happened for me, it's kind of the quintessential uh, college class. I went away to the university, I got in a philosophy class, and I had a professor that challenged my simplistic beliefs and challenged my belief that the Bible was the inspired word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, you know. That, that <laughs> that's I the book really, for me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But I, 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 that's what I was raised believing. But again, this professor challenged it, and I'm thinking, I know he's not right, because he was saying the Bible is not really inspired, it's full of myths and mistakes and so forth. And I knew I didn't agree with him, but I didn't know how to answer him. Mm. And so I had to, like you, I had to study it, I had to look into the evidence, I had to read some books, I had to study up to say, why do I believe what I believe? And as I did that, that helped my confidence grow as a Christian. And I think that describes for all of us that we can all benefit, that this information can help us in our own faith. As believers, to yes. strengthen our faith, to deepen our faith, to give us more confidence, to even encourage us to be more willing to share it. And then give us things to share yeah. to help other people in their faith. You know, even Jesus used evidence to back up his claims. I'm thinking of the story of John the Baptist. You know, if anybody should have been absolutely convinced of the identity of Jesus being the Son of God, it was John the Baptist. John the Baptist once pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. He saw the heavens open up. He heard the voice of the Father say, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. John the Baptist at one point pointed to Jesus and said, I have seen and I testify this is the Son of God. But then what happens? He gets arrested. He gets thrown in prison. And when tough times come, often doubts begin to creep in. And that's what started to happen. He started to have some hesitation, some questions. And, and so he got a couple friends together and he said, look, go track Jesus down and just ask him point blank, once and for all, are you the one we've been waiting for or are we to wait for somebody else? So his friends track down Jesus and tell him the situation. And how does Jesus react? What does Jesus do? Jesus gives evidence to John through his friends. Jesus says to those followers of Jesus, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. In other words, go back to John and tell him about the evidence that you've seen with your own eyes that convinces you that I am the one I claim to be. And so they go back and they tell John, but I think that's an example of how Jesus used evidence to back up his claims of being the unique son of God. That's right, and he did that constantly. You know, he did that with John the Baptist, but of course there's also the famous story of Thomas, doubting Thomas. Right. Uh, Jesus rises from the dead, he appears to other disciples, and Thomas isn't there. Yeah. And so he's saying, how do I know? And uh, in instead of Jesus shaming him or saying, well, you don't believe you're out, he appears to Thomas and he says, look, you wanted to see the holes in my hands, the scars, you know, in my side. Here I am. Check it out. He was willing to give evidence to Thomas and turn Thomas into a confident worshiper of him, uh, just like he did again with John the Baptist. And I think what we want to convey here is that this is normal. Yeah. Um, this idea of giving reasons for our faith doesn't diminish faith. It reinforces faith. What faith is, is trust in the same direction the evidence points. And uh, again, Jesus constantly gave evidence. I think of that verse, Lee, in John chapter 10, where Jesus sums it up. He says, you know, if you don't believe my words, then look at my works. Yeah. You know, look at the miracles that I'm doing. And, and see that these demonstrate that I am who I claim to be. I am the Son of God. I, I am from the Father. I do have divine power. I am all that I claim to be. And Jesus just did that constantly. So that was very normal for Jesus to use evidence and give reasons, but it was the same case with Paul. You know, I think about Paul, he would often sum up his ministry, and he would say, uh, we, what we do, we do to persuade people. 
We want people to see that this is true. And he would give all kinds of reasons and evidence. And one of my favorite verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 4 and 5, where he, Paul says this. He says, we demolish arguments. We take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Uh, he's using logic. He's using evidence. He's pointing to things like the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that people saw it and, and knew that he had risen. Paul does this constantly. He makes his case for Christ using the kinds of evidence that we're talking about in this course. That's what he did on Mars Hill when he was talking to the philosophers. And That's right. What did he do? He reasoned with them and, and uh, persuaded them. He used evidence. He used logic. He started with their unknown gods and built a case for the, true the real God, God the That's true a, God. Exactly right. And, you know, that was a tough audience. Yeah. It was a bunch of philosophers <laughs> in Athens, Greece, you know, the thought capital of the world. Tough yes. Crowd. And yet some of those philosophers were persuaded by Paul's persuasive approach, and they end up becoming followers of Christ. So we have Jesus doing this. We have Paul doing this. We have Peter, again, the verse that we've already talked about. 1 Peter 3.15, he says that he gives answers and he wants all of us to be giving answers for the reason for the hope that we have. So I, I think it's just important for us to realize this is biblical. And it's necessary in the kind of culture we live in today yeah. where you know people have moved further and further away from Christian beliefs and a Christian worldview. And they need this kind of information and evidence in order to be confident that what we're teaching is true. Yeah, when you look at the top six reasons that young people are leaving the church, three of those reasons uh, involve apologetics, or what that means is not apologizing for things, but uh, giving reasons, giving evidence, uh, uh, making a case, building a case for what we believe and to show uh, that it's true. So Mark, it's, uh, what you're saying is it's natural for us to use answers, to use evidence, to use logic, as well as a simple gospel message in communicating our faith to other people. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this course. We're, we're wedding apologetics and evangelism. You know, we don't do apologetics or give answers and give reasons and give evidence just to win an argument. Um, our purpose is to reach people with the message of Christ, to see them put their trust in Him, and to see their lives and eternities change as well. That's our goal. That's and, right. And, it's and, not to win an argument, it's to win people yeah. to Christ. Uh, apologetics is a handmaiden to evangelism. It's a tool that we use to reach people with the gospel. And as you say, in this increasingly skeptical world, it becomes ever more important for this course um, to communicate how we can wed the two of apologetics and evangelism together. That's right. So that's what we're going to be doing over these six sessions is kind of a mix of the practical side of how we can naturally talk about our faith, how we can talk about what God's done in our lives, how he's changed us, but also then get to more of the evidence and you're going to be doing some more of the teaching. We talk about how do we know the biblical record is reliable when we talk about Jesus? How do we know he really rose from the dead? And, and what does that tell us about who Jesus is and what his mission is and, and therefore the, the mission that we can have confidence in uh, as we explain it to other people? Uh, so we're going to really be doing both. We're going to be talking about practical ways to talk to people and real truth that we can present to them in those conversations. But what we want to do in this session and in your discussions that will follow in a few minutes is get really practical about how you can get the ball rolling in the first place. Yeah. You know, if, if we don't start the conversation, then we never get to present any evidence or really answer any of the questions. So what we want to do in this session, and especially uh, in your discussion time, is talk about natural ways that you can bring up the spiritual topic. Because our friends are interested in this stuff, more That's, interested than we think they are. Yeah, we usually think no one really wants to talk about this. It's actually the opposite. It really is. Getting into a spiritual conversation sounds a bit scary. Reminds me when I was a little kid and I'd, I'd find a spider in my bedroom and I'd freak out and I'd cry to my parents and my mom would come in and she'd look at me and she said, Lee, that spider is a lot more afraid of you than you are of him. 
And you know, it's similar. We think people are, are resistant to hearing the gospel. Yeah, and the reality is we're the ones that are often more afraid. And I think it's because we think they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hear about it. And sometimes you get the conversation going. The hard part is ending it. <laughs> yeah, because people are so interested and they have so many questions. And they're just looking for someone who's a reliable source to talk about these things. Someone who will be, as we said earlier, gentle, respectful, really listen to them, hear what their concerns, hear what their questions are. But then in that context of a safe you know, friendship and relationship and conversation convey what we know and what we've learned about Christ. So what we want to do is use the motion picture that I talked to you about earlier, The Case for Christ. You know, Mark and I were watching that film together one day and we realize that inadvertently, so to speak, um, the film does a great job of illustrating how it is that we can interact with people who are far from God and how the evidence comes into play. And we realize that there's a lot of lessons that this film can teach us. So we hope you get a chance, first of all, to watch the movie. Uh, either individually or as a group, so you can get the, the broad context of how all these scenes fit together. But right now, you're gonna see two scenes. In the first scene, you're gonna see Alfie, uh, who is a Christian woman, who encounters my wife, Leslie. My wife, Leslie, was spiritually confused at the time. Uh, I would say probably an agnostic, doesn't, didn't quite know what she believed, was certainly not a Christian at the time that they met. And so you see the circumstances in which Alfie meets Leslie and notice how Alfie brings up spiritual matters in that conversation. And then you're gonna see a later scene and this is after Alfie and Leslie have gone to church together and you're gonna see a conversation uh, unfold. And notice how it is that Alfie asks questions and talks so authentically and honestly with Leslie about matters of faith. I got positive. Ooh, well then. Of course she finds the biggest word on here, right? Asparagus? Wow, that is a big word. Not for a girl who's lost a tooth. Oh, okay. Big girl. I'm still impressed. Big girl who didn't eat her dinner. Full. You're full. Is that right? Are you gonna tell me you're hungry when we get home? All right, I'm gonna give you dessert if you eat one more noodle. That was easy. Let's see. You just have to bribe them a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. We done? Show me done. There's still spaghetti in there. <laughs> Swallow that. Take this, go. <laughs> Good work. <clears throat> you know, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Yeah? Mm-hmm. How's that? I am married to a published author. <laughs> it's very impressive. Mm-hmm, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love you. You and only you. Mm-hmm. Sweetie. Allie, what is it? Uh, Are you choking? I think she's choking. Allie, can you call? Hey, sweetie, just breathe for me, okay? Allie. Is everybody please, please just leave. give her, leave. Give her some space. Leave. Allie, I'm right here. Come on, honey, come on. Hey, baby, it's gonna Wait, be somebody okay. help us, please! Call an ambulance! It's okay, baby. I'm Look right at here. Dad, you okay? Okay, breathe for me. You're gonna be all right. No, I, I, baby, I'm right here. I don't, I don't know what to, I don't know what to do. I love you, sweetheart. Just okay, stay calm. Quick, 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 I'm a nurse. Allie, quick, please. quick, quick, quick. Okay, quick, just quick. stay calm. Come on. Come on, Allie, call for me. Please. Call, honey, can you do that? Please, please. 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 You don't have to thank me. I'm a nurse at Mercy Hospital. She's gonna be fine now. We are so lucky. Well, it's not luck. It's Jesus. My husband and I went our way to another restaurant tonight. Something told me I need to be here. Wow, thank you. Um, Leslie. Alfie, Alfie Davis. I'm not gonna forget you. <laughs> God bless you. Just keeping it interesting, huh? Keep drinking. How does it lead us? So did you ever go to church? Yeah, I went to church as a girl. Mm -hmm. 
And my mom sung hymns to me, but Lee and I moved on from how we were raised. And uh, what is it that Lee believes in again? Just the facts. <laughs> I've always been kind of curious, but uh, lately, you know, having Allison and now, it's just starting to seem more important to know. And I don't believe that it was a coincidence that you came to the restaurant. I don't, so... <laughs> what do I do with that? What do you think you should do with it? I don't know. I've just... <laughs> I've just spent most of my life feeling like God is a million miles away. Oh, no, sweetheart. So. here, right now, waiting for you to talk to him. You know, I enjoy watching those clips, Lee, and I always think about what was going through Alfie's mind when she's in that restaurant, she's just helped Allison, she saved her life, and she's thinking, should I bring it up or not? Mm. And I think we often are in those situations where we make these split-second spiritual decisions. And she, should I or shouldn't I? And then she takes a deep breath, and she does. And she says, you know, it was Jesus. And I don't know, sometimes that I think that might even feel like, do I force this? Is it natural or not? And yet, if we don't take that risk, we're not even going to get in the conversation. So she does it, she takes the risk, and God uses it in a powerful way. Yeah. It, it certainly paid off uh, for her to take that risk in that situation. And for us to be aware, to have our antenna up for those opportunities as God brings them our way, yeah. to seize that split second opportunity to share Jesus, to bring him up, to engage in a conversation with someone. And I love the fact, if you notice in the conversation in the car with Alfie and Leslie, how Leslie was really interested in these spiritual matters. Yeah. Uh, Alfie didn't have to force her no. into a conversation. It's what we were saying earlier. People are more interested than we think they are. And it's true with Leslie. I mean, she had some spiritual exposure as a child, uh, but not a lot. And she, like a lot of our friends, have questions. They have doubts. They have stories that they want to tell and the experiences that they want to share with us. And I think that's a good example of that conversation. I love the way that Alfie sort of, by the questions that she asked, elicited Leslie's uh, comments and her observations and how the emotions began to flow as a result. Yeah. Well, we're gonna hand the baton now to the facilitator and let you all discuss these matters and see how you can do in your own friendships and your own conversations what Alfie did with Leslie in those clips. 